International Women's Day this month, today's BizTech Health and Wellness Show is focusing on women and children's health. Joining us on the show are two doctors from Sunway Medical Center. They are Dr. Janani Sivanadan, consultant in obstetrics and gynecology, maternal fetal medicine, and Dr. Yao Ken Man, consultant in pediatric nephrology. Dr. Jalani and Dr. Yao will be speaking on high-risk pregnancies and kidney disease in children. Welcome to the show, doctors. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you, Sharon. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay. Uh, before we go into the discussion on high-risk pregnancies and kidney diseases in children, both of you have very interesting subspecialties. Maybe Dr. Jalani, can you share with us a bit on your subspecialty, which is in maternal fetal medicine? Okay, so um, maternal fetal medicine is a subspecialty uh, in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, one of the four. The other uh, subspecialties are in uh, gynae oncology that deals with cancers, urogynecology that uh, deals with the waterworks of the woman, um, and uh, fertility, uh, which obviously is uh, for um, uh, artificial reproductive techniques. So maternal fetal, as the name uh, itself says, it, it uh, encompasses uh, two parts uh, of the mother, uh, wherein we uh, look after women who have got um, um, prior pre-existing pre medical conditions, as well as conditions that develop during uh, pregnancy, as well as uh, we look into the uh, fetus or the baby when in, in the mom's womb to um, detect any problems or abnormalities um, in the baby. What about you, Dr. Yao? Uh, can you explain on what is um, pediatric uh, nephrology? Yeah, so I think um, you can actually split that term into two words, right? I'm sure the public will be very familiar with nephrologists, right? In view that we have a 40,000 adult on dialysis role now. So I think, so. of course, when you come to PIS nephrologists, okay, it literally translates that, you know, any children disease, um, children with a kidney disease, uh, when they are younger than 18 years old, then my role is mainly to diagnose, to treat, and to manage, you know, all these kidney disorder uh, among the children, be it um, uh, the kidney tract anomaly, or um, how to say they have uh, some infection or hyperpressure, or any um, genetic related kidney disease, as well as a kidney stone. Um, so, um, so I mean, anyone that, that, that below 18 years old with kidney problems, you will fall under my responsibility. Yeah. So including dialysis and transplant. Yeah. Generally for women having a baby is a natural process. After a full term pregnancy, women go into labor either on or near their due date or and give birth to a healthy baby. Dr. Janani, what is a high risk pregnancy and the complications that could occur? Okay, so high risk uh, pregnancy is one of greater risk to the mother or the her fetus compared to an uncomplicated pregnancy. So pregnancy is not a disease. However, it does place additional physical and emotional changes or stressors onto the woman's body. So uh, if a woman is already predisposed to an underlying medical uh, condition such as uh, diabetes or high blood pressure, heart diseases, kidney diseases, autoimmune diseases, or thyroid issues. These may either uh, remain stable or worsen in pregnancy. This in turn uh, may affect the development of the fetus, such as uh, causing birth defects, growth restriction, um, preterm birth, and higher chances of stillbirth compared to the general uh, population. Other than these underlying medical conditions, uh, some women may have um, recurrent miscarriages or cervical weakness or insufficiency with uh, pregnancy loss, um, multiple or triplet pregnancies, carriers of genetic disorders, which all put them in this high-risk group. Okay, As to what are the complications uh, that could occur, um, they may develop um, gestational, that means diabetes in pregnancy, 
um, preeclampsia, which is the um, high blood pressure and losing of protein um, in the urine um, and um, other such uh, complications. Um, so, uh, how do actually um, you know you you mentioned the uh, the complications? So, what can a mother do to actually um, to you, you going to say to um, to actually mini how do you to minimize the risk or is there a way to or is because they are already having that kind of problems that kind of complications that also it will lead to the to the pregnancy of the mother so yeah so they they already may know that they have all these medical problems so what is uh, pertinent is actually um, the woman should go for a preconception clinic um, before she is pregnant and see the doctors um, and the specialists to, 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 to see if her medical condition is actually stable in remission and if it, if it is safe for her to, to conceive at this point of time. Even the um, cardiologist, if there's a heart disease, um, so they can advise on the, um, the, the safety of her pregnancy at that point of time. And then once she's already pregnant, obviously it will be a multidisciplinary team um, management wherein um, it involves the maternal fetal medicine specialist as well as the other um, specialists uh, involved from the other teams um, such as the uh, rheumatologist or the nephrologist as uh, Kenman is, um, I mean for pediatric base, but adult uh, nephrologist to uh, co-manage um, the mom during the antenatal care. And then um, if, for instance, there is a problem in the baby, then uh, we get the um, neonatologist involved so that the parents can be counseled on what to anticipate uh, in these kind of um, problems. And then um, a, a, a care of plan for the um, antenatal as well as the intrapartum or during labor is discussed together and set out so that um, everything has been uh, prepared. Yeah. Dr. Janani, when there are instances where there are multiple births, right? Um, will the mother be, I mean, carrying twins or triplets? Is it, does it actually increase the risk of um, premature labor? Or yes, um, definitely. Or blood pressure. Yes, definitely. So multiple pregnancy itself is a high risk pregnancy. Um, not only does it predispose to diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, or preterm birth, there are higher chances of miscarriage, um, fetal defects, um, fetal growth restriction, stillbirth rate increases, and uh, there's risk of. Um, venous thromboembolism, that is um, blood clots occurring in either the legs or um, that goes to the lungs, pulmonary embolism, and upon um, delivery postpartum hemorrhage, as in there's more bleeding, um, more frequent delivery uh, by caesarean section. Um, so these are, these are um, the problems that- um, What's the percentage like, Dr. Janani? I mean, um women carrying multiple births and having this um, kind of um, complications? So it, it depends on, see, multiple births itself, um, there are various types. So even in twin pregnancies, it depends on whether the babies are sharing the placenta. Uh, these are called monochorionic uh, twins, uh, or whether each twin has its own placenta. So th those are dichorionic. So the, the risk is lesser when there, it's a dichorionic. Monochorionic, the risk are uh, further enhanced. So um, there is risk of something called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, which occurs in like about 30% of pregnancies. So in across the board, um, risk of uh, preterm labor is um, about 60%. So uh, risk of stillbirth is about 50%. Uh, so depending on the type of um, twins or triplets um, that, so, but nevertheless, um, it is high risk and higher chances of complications. Maybe Dr. Yao, yep. uh, 
you can share with us on this, yeah. When the pregnancy is high risk, generally, what are the some of the actually health complications that could occur in the different stages of a child's life, for example, as a fetus, you know, baby, toddler, even um, to an older child? Right. I think this is um, this is quite a big topic, you see. So I think so we probably need to dissect to your element. Uh, really much depends on the, what is the maternal complication to begin with, right? Let's say, for instance, if the baby is um, born prematurely, right? So we know that as, um, those uh, babies who are actually uh, less than 30 weeks or whatever, their lungs may not be, may not be mature enough to, uh, um, to breathe on their own. So they will need ventilator support. And, um, you know, they are all, they are all very tiny and, um, how to say, um, uh, uh, to, to, to look up, look for, to look, look after for and then, um, how to say, uh, in that case, okay, um, all these uh, premature baby, okay, when they're born too small or too young, okay, they're subject to more complication compared to term baby, okay, be it in the lung development, be it in the brain development, you know, and also, uh, how to say, um, the subsequent care, yeah, so um, they are prone for more infection, you know, in, during the early stage of life, and of course, and then in, then you're talking about if a mother has a diabetes or um, how to say um, and so on, the baby actually is more prone for congenital anomaly. Okay, um, they can have uh, what you call that uh, the heart uh, uh, heart heart defect. Okay, and also kidney tract defect and so on. Right, and for those uh, who mother who at one age kind of things, so we do know that okay, they are actually uh, at the increasing risk of getting a, a, a Down syndrome baby. So, for instance, anyone, um, any mother who are actually pregnant at, uh, after 40 years old, you know, so if there's a 1 in 100 chance of getting a Down syndrome baby. So, it's really very much depends on um, what is the maternal risk factor to begin with. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what about for children? When it comes to children, what are the factors that actually could cause kidney disease? I mean, for and it's such a young age, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think for these things, I think uh, we need to we need to uh, stage them according to their age because the causes uh, and etiology are very different. Um, basically, those uh, less than four years old, okay, uh, most of the kidney disease are actually uh, focused uh, uh, into uh, uh, the structural aspect of kidney. They might born with a lousy kidney. They may born with a how say uh, uh, how say uh, some blockage in the in the in the urinary tract kind of things. Yeah. So then this little predispose them to get an infection in the kidney tract. Yeah. So and um, and for those who are actually four years and above, okay. So um, uh, the issue that we usually encounter is like big wetting. You know, I'm sure um, um, most of the public will 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 aware that you know the, the children after four years old, you know, they're still on diaper, they're still wetting their bed and, and after school going. So this is one of the one of the major issues that we see uh, in relation, okay. And the other thing is like um, in my uh, the other cause of a kidney problem is the inflammation of the kidney. Okay, it's not really infection related. Okay, so we generally group all these things under a term called glomerulonephritis. Yeah, it's not um, it's about uh, how to say it's not commonly seen. Okay, um, but when this uh, happen, okay, uh, it can actually lead the kidney into a uh, lead the child into dialysis. Uh, you know, yeah. So, hmm, yeah. So for those school school going children, um, uh, mainly. Uh, what we test to see is uh, they um, uh, they have this problem called dysfunctional bowel bladder. Literally means that okay they um, they they so used to uh, how to say voluntarily hold their bladder and uh, constipated you know end up you know the bladder become uh, dysregulated you know when passing urine yeah so yeah. So what's the percentage like for children going um, for dialysis? Hmm. Um, of, of course, uh, how to say, um, children on dialysis, it's just a fragment, you know, of uh, what um, a Malaysian adult, uh, uh, of the Malaysian adult dialysis cohort. Um, at this point of time, I'm talking to you, okay, um, there's 1,000 children on chronic dialysis row, and uh, 600 of them actually are less than 14 years old. Yeah. Mm. Very young, yeah. And how yeah. often do they need to go for their treatments? Pardon? How often do they need to go for their treatments? Um, I think it all depends on which modality you choose, okay? Because uh, we have a two dialysis modality. One is the common one, um, the, the one that commonly known by uh, public is the hemodialysis, means that dialysis uh, through the blood, right? And the second one is called peritoneal dialysis, 
means uh, we try to uh, remove the toxin uh, through the uh, stomach cavity. Yeah. So uh, different mortality, the frequency and duration of dialysis will be different, right? Generally, hemodialysis is like uh, three times a week, you know, and every session run about four hours. Yeah. So, but peritonalysis uh, is uh, is basically um, how to say everyday business for the child and the family. Yeah. So it really depends on what modality we're talking about. Yeah. Can they do it at home? Um, yes, for they come to the hospital. Yeah, I think the benefit of uh, peritonalysis in the sense that uh, children and family can have that done at their home and so that uh, less disruptive to their uh, normal activity at school life. Yeah. Mm. Unlike so, hemodialysis, they need to come to the hospital. Yeah. Dr. Yao, can you share with us some of the signs and symptoms that parents actually should look out for? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, obviously, I think uh, how to say, uh, uh, it's important to detect the kidney disease early, right? Because if we detect early, we still we can still try to reverse the damage or try to limit the damage at the most. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I think so, um, every year we are seeing a uh, how to say a patient, all these children come in, okay, um, with symptoms that have been lasted for years or you know, and and by the time they they come to us, it's really too late for us to do anything. I think the main thing, the the um the main thing about kidney disease in children is that it doesn't have a specific signs and symptoms. You know, all the signs and symptoms are very vague. Okay, for instance, um, a child with kidney disease uh, that has been a long-standing one. Okay, the child do not grow well. It tends to look small and uh, skinny. You know, and also they look pale, not very energetic. You see, all these things, um, all these symptoms are not very clear-cut uh, pointing towards the kidney disease. It can be any things of your body that goes wrong, right? Yeah. So I would say that, okay, um, um, I think uh, uh, if my advice to parents would be like, okay, if your child has fever, especially the, the younger uh, they are, okay, they have fever, don't simply brush it out and say that this is something uh, benign and, and, you know, uh, I would just give you some paracetamol and things settle, right? Because uh, most of the times, uh, how to say, uh, um, most of the times uh, when we encounter uh, kidney disease, okay, it can be a urinary tract infection. It can be long-standing and uh, if you live uh, without any treatment, the kidney will just, the kidney function will just go down the hill, right? And then second thing in the sense that um, if your child, okay, looks smaller than your, your other children, you know, and, and, um, uh, don't just um, ignore it, okay, and condemn on their uh, diet pattern. Because we know that a freaky eater, you know, they tend to grow small, whatever. This is usually why we find the excuse to, to how to say, um, uh, to assemble them from further examination. But I would say that if a child looks small, and, you know, then your other children, and they look pale, you know, go and seek a medical uh, advice, proper medical advice. And of course, okay, the other, the other sign and symptoms would be like, when their urine become red color or become like uh, very frothy, like the root beer that you used to take, all right, this is also a, not a normal size, uh, you know, that, that, that one should have. Yeah, so I think generally these are the things that one should look for, yeah. So, so for, I mean, a, an adult and a child, so um, facing kidney diseases, mm. uh, so is there much, a lot of difference? Yeah, um, uh, well, I think uh, uh, it's not easy, uh, how to say, I think it really depends on, uh, 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 okay, first of all, the cost of causing kidney disease in adult and children are entirely different, all right? Um, as uh, we, we all know that, okay, adult kidney disease are mainly due to uh, our lifestyle. We overeat things, you know, and, and obese kind of thing. So we know that 65% of the anti-renal disease in adult are due to diabetes mellitus and 10% are due to hypertension. Obviously, you don't see this kind of etiology in children, right? Okay, so for children, okay, for those who develop, uh, how say, who end up needed dialysis support, um, 25 to 30% because of the congenital anomaly of the kidney tract, which will be, uh, how say, Dr. Jalani field, right? To, to, to pick it up early. Right, and um, how say, uh, and the other twenty five percent, okay, are due to uh, how say, inflammation of the kidney, which they acquire later on, not due to infection, okay, but uh, uh, it just 
some form like uh, how to say uh, I've heard of autoimmune disease kind of related, right? So so the causes are different. That's one thing. Second thing is like um, the burden of looking after a, a, a kidney disease in children and adult, okay, especially when they come into a, a dialysis support. Then um, the cost needed to look after a child with uh, end stage renal failure is a triple the amount that you need for adult. Yeah, so it's very costly treatment. That's one thing. And technically, it's very challenging. Yeah, but other than that, okay, um, Malaysia uh, do provide okay A to Z treatment for all children with kidney disease, down from uh, how to say a uh, confirmed disease from becoming end stage until renal replacement therapy in all form of dialysis and kidney transplant. Yeah. So, so what other kinds of treatments for children are? Is it actually curable? I think it's very much depends on the cost. Oh, right? Um, yeah, it depends on the cost, okay? Uh, I would say that um, those uh, born with, even, even those with, uh, uh, born with a congenital anomaly of the kidney tract, okay, um, not all will be so great. Some, after surgical repair, and over time, they will grow out of it, okay? But uh, for those, uh, how to say, who born with really lousy kidney and uh, literally, uh, how to say, uh, barely function kidney, yeah, they will need dialysis support in the very beginning, you know, until they get a new kidney transplant. So it's literally depends on, on the cost and etiology, yeah. So of course, our role here in the sense that uh, we try to sustain the kidney function, right? Um, until the child, uh, how to say, uh, grow to an older age, you know, uh, uh, waiting for the disease to burn out, okay? And at the same time, okay, um, try to limit the further damage to the kidney. So yeah, there are, there are actually, there are a lot of varieties of treatment available for kid, child with kidney disease, yeah, so. Dr. Yao, uh, sorry, um, from your experience, maybe can you share it, uh, with us um, a case that you have actually managed? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to figure out which story should I tell, you see, because uh, uh, I've been managing children with kidney disease from birth until 18 years old, you know, from those who, uh, how to say, um, from those who successfully get a kidney transplant uh, to those who do not uh, manage to get to that stage, right? Um, if I want to say of any as uh, story, I probably would just uh, put up a while. This um, um, team um, is um, indigenous tribe from Kuala Lumpur, Baru, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you you don't understand, um, our field is very niche. Yes. So literally, um, how to say, uh, uh, the center that cater for dialysis for children, okay, uh, only center, uh, uh, how to say, in one or two center in the Klang Valley. So, so this patient actually have an uh, underlying disease due to inflammation and eventually uh, went to end stage, right? Um, his, his housing condition is something that uh, probably um, you will not um, uh, appreciate very well. They're literally living in the heart. You know the heart, just a bamboo heart kind of things. So, so they travel, uh, but uh, at one stage, um, the kid, we're no longer able to uh, keep the kidney function and the child needed dialysis support. So the mother literally travel uh, like 20 kilometers down from Kuala Baru three times a week to come to a uh, house at the hospital for dialysis service. And um, the good thing in the sense that I think uh, uh, few years, I think four to five years down the line, eventually um, he received a kidney transplant. Okay, um, um, from a cadaveric uh, uh, donor. So yeah, so they kind of changed their life. But um, I mean, so it kind of registered in my mind because uh, you see, these are all illiterate. Uh, uh, they are not really well educated in the first yes. place. But um, the mother determination to save the child, they really motivate them to go on and go on. It's not easy um, to be to be in their position and uh, and continue that you know for years. You know, you imagine like taking taking the bus, uh, uh, spending hours on journey just for the life serving dialysis. Yes. Yeah, so I think they kind of touched me, like, you know, because, uh, yeah. So in, in the other word, okay, um, in Malaysia, okay, we can still uh, perform dialysis and transplant for children. Yeah, irrespective of what your race is and what your hierarchy is. Yeah, so. 
Okay. Okay. Coming back to you, Dr. Janani. Um, modern women nowadays, right? Um, they tend to have children later in life. So when it comes to geriatric uh, pregnancy for those who are actually giving birth um, above the age of 35 or even touching their 40s, would the risk be actually higher? Even if it's a first birth? Uh, yeah, so actually we wouldn't use the term geriatric because uh, women getting pregnant above the age uh, 35 nowadays is sort of like the new norm. So okay. We're all geriatric by the definitions of <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what we would say a uh, very advanced uh, maternal age is actually more than 45 years old. So 35 and all is considered quite uh, Okay, by, but though by definitions, it's advanced uh, maternal age. So most of my patients are actually um, 40 years old, oh, even okay. in their first pregnancies, um, mainly because, you know, women are, are seeking, um, having education and postponing their um, pregnancies, or they may be working in a male-dominated field, which uh, do not support motherhood as much, or... Um, there might be lack of childcare, um, workplace um, policies, and you know, so they might think that they can't be a wage earner as well as a mother at the same time. And uh, you know, there's also cultural and value shifts um, where women are not really ready to have a child. In addition to that, with the um, um, advancement of uh, fertility care or uh, artificial reproductive techniques, um, women who previously probably could not conceive on their own, are, are given the chance to conceive and uh, hence why they are getting pregnant at an older age. So definitely um, advanced maternal age uh, carries a higher risk um, as um, these women are already at a, a older age group. And because of that, they would be more predisposed to medical problems such as diabetes, high blood pressure, um, heart problems. Um, and um, other than that, um, there is risk of multiple pregnancies because it's higher in the older age groups as well as those who have had a fertility treatment and abnormal placentation. That means the placenta is um, low lying. Um, and in these women, there's higher risk for um, intensive care uh, unit admission, uh, delivery by cesarean section, um, blood transfusion due to um, bleeding during delivery, uh, prolonged hospital stay, and venous thromboembolism. So the risk actually um, increases as uh, we age. Yeah. So isn't um, multiple birth like twins or triplets, I um, mean, genetic? Um, Yes, that can be in, in certain cases. However, uh, as the women age as well, the, the chances for multiple pregnancy increases, especially if it's a spontaneous or they conceive on their own. Okay. Uh, but the, in the current um, era, most of the multiple pregnancies are due to um, um, IVF or things like that. Yeah. I see. Dr. Janani, how do you manage the emotional or all the mental wellness of the mother when it comes to a high-risk pregnancy? I think um, the woman is already um, prepared from day one when she already is either preconception that we, we do uh, explain what to anticipate uh, as uh, she gets pregnant and as she goes through the first, second and third trimester until labor and delivery and postpartum. So, uh, once she's pregnant in the first trimester itself, uh, we will also uh, reiterate all the risk and, um, you know, um, so the woman is uh, mentally prepared. So these women usually, I mean, they are quite um, strong. I mean, as we know, women are very strong-willed and uh, yes. yeah, so they do handle it pretty well. Um, it's just if things happen unexpectedly, so everything has been going fine and then suddenly boom something happens or that we detect some problem in the baby and that becomes a bit of an um, roller coaster ride for the couple as in because this is you know they were expecting uh, an uncomplicated pregnancy and then suddenly something 
comes in. So uh, we do sit them down and counsel. Um, that's why it's important to get the um, other, other specialities in so that they are fully informed regarding the uh, problem that they are facing and what are the uh, measures that can be taken to outcome uh, for the for a better outcome for either the mother or the baby. Dr. Janani, can you share with us um, a complicated high-risk pregnancy case that you have managed before? Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, I, I will just mention about the case that I just uh, had this morning. Um, okay. That was, um, so basically this is a, a staff, um, um, medical staff. So being a medical staff itself is sort of high risk. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that so? Yeah, because we tend to uh, overlook our own symptoms. Oh, I see. We tend to our, you know, our severity and uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's it's a it's a thing amongst um, medical, yeah. <laughs> medical staff that when they uh, the medic the staff is a uh, patient, they are already like at high risk because <laughs> yeah, because you know. I would think that I mean medical staff I mean from the same hospital you will be more aware and more vigilant because you know like you have um come I mean if you are facing any slight um complication or problems you just run to the doctors. Don't worry, we try to rationalize it and you know try to. Uh, Think that it's just some minor things, you know. So yeah. Yeah, probably because you think you're in the profession, and so you downplay it and think, yeah. nah, it's it's okay, kind of thing. But uh, this patient of mine was actually from another state, um, okay. so um, she she um, is advanced age, uh, around thirty nine, and this was um, her first pregnancy, which uh, conceived by IVF after um, six years of marriage and um, it was a uh, twins um, and um, she, she, not, she, not, she did not have any prior medical uh, problems. However, she was um, in the first trimester when I uh, saw her, she had um, increased risk for developing preeclampsia based on the screening that we do. And so I had started her on uh, blood thinning agents such as aspirin to prevent um, preeclampsia uh, from setting in. Um, pregnancy went on well. Um, however, um, she developed uh, preeclampsia at the later stage in pregnancy at the third trimester, almost at about um, 35 weeks onwards. Um, and uh, she was also hospitalized for uh, pneumonia uh, in this COVID uh, era, you know, coming with uh, fever as well as uh, respiratory symptoms is always, you know, a worry that it may have been COVID, but um, it was just a bacterial uh, pneumonia. So even in that case, um, she actually went to another hospital first and uh, they were worried to take her in because of the high risk that she was, um, her blood pressure was going up. It was a twin pregnancy, IVF and all this, that uh, they were a bit um, reluctant to take her in. And so she came uh, to um, back to my hospital and uh, she was admitted here and treated and all that. And um, because she developed preeclampsia, so we had to start her on uh, anti um, hypertensives to uh, stabilize that as well as um, blood thinning agents, injections, <laughs> because she's at higher risk for developing blood clots in the leg and things. And then she was discharged well, and um, um, she had a cesarean section uh, as a mode of delivery. Um, and um, the babies uh, were born well. Um, um, however, she did have a bit of bleeding uh, during the operation a bit more. Definitely, we would anticipate that because the womb is stretched out uh, more. Um, because of two babies. Yeah, so that was an um, example of uh, one of the cases, yeah. So with the, I mean, the complications and with the tr treatments, right? So would it actually harm the fetus, the baby? Um, so all the medications that we use in pregnancy is uh, obviously safe, safe for the mother and the baby. So. Uh, we need to be aware of uh, medications that would be safe and we avoid uh, the medications that are 
uh, that may harm the baby. So definitely, even so women who already are diabetic or uh, hypertensive on certain medications, it is all um, changed to the ones that are safer in pregnancy once or just before they start conceiving or once they've started, I mean, once they've, uh, they are pregnant. Dr. Janani, what advice would you give women who might want to know how they can actually increase their chances of having a healthy baby? Okay, so um, generally, if they're on a journey or to, trying to embark on a pregnancy, um, it would be advisable to go and seek um, um, a specialist care at a preconception clinic just to ensure that um, their general well-being is okay, or if they actually have prior medical problems, that that is all stable. Um, um, and um, given the green light to actually uh, embark on a pregnancy, and uh, pre pre-pregnancy uh, folic acid of uh, 400 micrograms or or five uh, milligrams. That's what the standard one that we have. Um, two to three months before trying to conceive. Um, keeping a healthy lifestyle, as in um, um, eating well, not eating healthy food, um, exercising, um, avoiding um, pollutants or external radiation, um, and then once they're pregnant, to have a proper antenatal care um, and um, their first trimester, in the first trimester, the, um, their certain screening tests that can be done to see if there's any risk for the baby as well as for the mother to develop preeclampsia uh, and then followed by a normally scan which is a detailed scan to detect if there are any problems in the baby or the baby is structurally normal and following that growth scans and we will also be doing um, a glucose tolerance tests to see if the mother has uh, would develop um, diabetes or gestational diabetes, um, keeping an eye on her blood pressure, especially towards the third trimester, assessing for risk of um, venous thromboembolism or blood clots in the leg okay. um, at every opportunity when she comes for antenatal care. So if all this is done, um, then there should be um, a um, healthy outcome for both mom and baby. At the end of it, and obviously a discussion regarding the mode of delivery between the uh, couple and the obstetrician. Okay, finally, Dr. Janani, any tips for pregnant women um, or pregnant mothers who actually are listening in today? Um, pregnancy is a very uh, joyful uh, period in one's life. Uh, it's it's a change that occurs that will change you entirely um, and uh, so what I would say is um, enjoy your pregnancy um, you know um, do things that that would um, make you happy um, either paint or or sing listen to music um, do things like that and and start bonding with your baby um, as soon as you're pregnant because um, that is very important so um, talk to your baby and um, that, that bonding should develop from within. And that is also shown to actually improve the uh, baby's um, bond with the mom once the baby is born. So, yeah. What about you, Dr. Yao? Any children care tips for parents whose children who might need specialized care in terms of kidney um, complications? Right. Uh, I think I echo what Dr. Jani mentioned just now. Uh, a proper pregnancy uh, care and planning is very important huh? uh, because you look at our own uh, Malaysian statistic in the sense that um, oh, 13, 13 out of 1,000 birth uh, will have a thalassemia. Uh, it's a disease that affects the uh, red blood cell that making uh, it uh, not able to, uh, to perform the desired job carrying oxygen to the body. So, and uh, this group of the children uh, how say, uh, who suffer from the disease uh, will require a very regular blood blood transfusion and uh, their lifespan is shorter than the others, uh, you know, children. So I think it's very good to, uh, how to say, um, because since it's a very highly prevalent disease among uh, our population, it's good for both uh, those uh, couple who plan to uh, 
how to say a uh, plan uh, who plan to have a kid kind of things okay to have a genetic testing before and mark you know um, to to go on pregnant or whatever and the second thing in the sense that um there's something called neurotube defect it's basically um the incomplete fusion of the backbone that making uh, def- uh that making the what I call that uh, the defect on the spinal cord and the prevalence is actually quite high in Malaysia in two in one thousand it's definitely higher than all the developed country and once the baby is born with that kind of a defect okay uh, if they're going to leave the child uh, in permanent disability in terms of uh, movement and also the bladder and bowel function. And, and this can easily be corrected just by giving them, uh, the pregnant woman, you know, uh, on a poly supplement like what Dr. Chantanani Jan- said. So that's why I say it's, it's good to have uh, all those, uh, um, how to say, um, uh, what you call that, um, women who plan to pregnant whatever, to plan their pregnancy early, you know, and, and you know, and go to a certified doctor to have uh, all the uh, checkout, you know, or scan or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, secondly, in the sense that uh, don't simply um, treat yourself with unnecessary medication. Because so we know that some medication actually can uh, uh, affect the uh, baby growth in, in, uh, during pregnancy. And uh, just like, you know, some uh, blood thinning agent kind of thing. So, we have seen that, you know, happen again and again in this part of the country, in this part of the world. Yeah, so this is something that can uh, be done by, you know, all the women, you know, in this country. Yeah, so, uh, of course, um, uh, in subsequent times, uh, how say, in, in, for all those children, you know, they're under your guidance, okay, um, just be cautious of uh, uh, using uh, any unconventional medicine or any home remedy, you know, when the child falls sick or whatever. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think so, uh, we are still... Um, we, we still can easily find these uh, illegal, so, uh, 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 I, I, would, I wouldn't call it drug or medicine, I would just call it some uh, home remedy in the market, readily available, but contain high um, uh, heavy metal and also steroid, you know, and this is not good for the child and even for the kidney health. And for those uh, who have a child with a chronic kidney disease, um, I empathy them, okay, um, I feel with them because it's a lifelong journey and it's something that uh how to say um you you you, you can't you can't get away but live with it so with that okay uh, my advice to them is just uh, try to adhere to your doctor's uh, management all right um and also again um just like what we have discussed earlier on okay uh, always be vigilant and watch out for any signs and symptoms that points towards kidney disease in children for instance, like I, like I mentioned just now, uh, poor growth, okay, uh, poor weight gain, or the child doesn't uh, have a recurrent fever uh, with unknown source. Yeah. So if your child experiences any of this, bring him or her to a proper medical checkup. Yeah. So that's probably my advice to them. Yeah. Thank you, doctors, for taking the time to be on our show. I'm Sharon Chung, and I've been speaking to Dr. Janani Sivanadan, consultant in obstetrics and Gynecology Maternal Fetal Medicine, and Dr. Yao Ken Man, Consultant in Pediatric Nephrology. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn site, as well as on our website, www.biztype.asia. Please check out our website for business and technology conversation.